Hey, welcome back. Uh, thanks so much for uh, being with us. I am grateful for the way that we can do this. Uh, I, I, I'm so thankful that we live in the time that we live in uh, that, that affords us this opportunity. I, I want to tell you, as, as things begin to shift, a couple of things before we uh, jump back into our study of First Peter and as we talk about uh, the elect exiles. Um, I want you to know that, that regardless of what assembly looks like over the next few weeks, uh, over the next few months, and maybe even longer term than that, I want you to know that we are committed to continuing to do this. That if in your wisdom you feel like the best choice you can make is to continue to worship online with us, we're gonna keep doing this. Um, I, I'm so overwhelmed with conviction from the Lord. I'm overwhelmed um, from or by comments that, that people have, have sent us. And so I, I think it's really important for you to know that, that we're committed to this. Um, and so if you choose to stay home, uh, you're not gonna miss anything. Uh, you're going to continue to be able to do what we've been doing now. I also want you to know that if you're not in the Cookville area, if you're not a part of the College Side family, we're going to continue to do this. And I, I would ask you, really at this juncture, at this point of time, to lean in with us. Um, you can make contact with our church office. Doesn't matter where you're watching, anywhere across the world. Um, make contact with our church office. Um, I, I believe that there is something to this. I don't know what that is yet. Um, and I want you to hear me say that. I, I, I don't know what that is yet. But I believe there's something to it. And I think that God could use this in ways that we didn't think were possible two months ago. And so um, we're going to continue to be prayerful. We're going to continue to be committed to, to interacting in this way on Sundays, and if you're watching on a different day, uh, on, on the days that you watch it, we're gonna be committed to this so that God would continue to shape this opportunity into what he wants it to be. Again, we don't know what that looks like, but we know that there's something there, and we wanna be sensitive to that. So I think it's important for you to know that if you are a part of the College Side family uh, and you wanna stay at home right now, um, there's no guilt in that, and we're going to continue to do this. Um, we hope, um, we know, we have strong conviction that at some point in time, we're going to be back together hugging, um, being together, shaking hands, singing and worshiping together the way we did, but we also want to explore this opportunity. So I think it's important for you to know that. Before we start this morning, let's, um, let's bow and ask God to bless our time, and then we'll jump in and we'll study together. Let's pray. God, I'm grateful for the opportunity that you have given us. Father, if the last several months have taught us anything, it's that the opportunities that we thought were possible um, were limited when we compare those to the opportunities that you have created. So Father, I pray that we would continue to be sensitive, that we would be sensitive to one another, that we would be sensitive to your word and that we would be sensitive to where you might be leading us. God, I freely admit that I don't know where that is um, in regard to the day that we live in and technology. I just pray that you would surround us with people and with wisdom and discernment for that purpose. God, I pray specifically for our time now that you would help us as we continue to study in 1 Peter. We're grateful for the text. We pray your blessings and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have you ever known somebody who filled up a room? Maybe you know what I mean. Have you ever known somebody that when entering a room, you just kind of felt their presence? Or if that person left a room, you kind of 
felt their presence. I think probably all of us have, have known at least a person or two like that, somebody who's got such, whether it's a strong personality or strong will or uh, a lot of responsibility, somebody we've known who just kind of fills up a room. There are people like that. It's rare, but people like that all around the world. Now, I want you to think about that person. Who is it for you or who was it for you? A parent or, or a grandparent? Maybe it's, maybe it's the boss at work, an elected official, maybe an old preacher. I, I don't know. Who is it for you that whenever they come into a room, you just sense their presence? There, there is power in presence, particularly with people like that. But what's interesting to me is that the reality is we are all that for somebody at some point or another. So if your child is crying in the middle of the night, many times if mom or dad goes into the room and just speaks a word, there's power in presence. There's power in presence. And if you don't have that now, you likely did at one time, at least for one other person, or you will at some point in the future. Many times when we lose people, we know the logic behind the loss, but it's the presence that we miss the most. I want you to think about that person for you. Who is that person? Here's what I want you to know this morning. God, God knows the power of presence. God wired us that way to feel presence, to long for presence, or if we are those people, to exert presence presence that would comfort other people. This is why it's so incredibly energizing to me to think about the way that God continually manifested himself in the world. However God chose to interact with people would have been right. He could, he could have done anything. God could have been a voice shouting from the heavens throughout it all, and it would have been right, and it would have been good, and it would have been appropriate, and it would have been proper, and it would have been holy. God could have made any choice that he wanted to make, and he would have been God. But more times than not, God chooses to demonstrate himself to his people through presence. He demonstrates over and over and over and over again that He is with us. He is over us. He is behind us. He is beneath us. He is in front of us. All of that is true, and all of that would be good enough, but He is not just over us and behind us and beneath us and in front of us. He is with us. And that changes things. He's in all those places, but He is with us. He's been with His people throughout the history of the world. I just sat down at my desk this week and just jotted a couple of notes that just immediately started coming to my mind when I thought about the presence of of God. Adam and Eve at the very beginning knew the sound of the presence of God. God continually visited Abraham to demonstrate one thing over and over and over. Abraham, in the midst of promise and in the midst of challenge, I am with 
you. God demonstrated how he was with Moses before he called him to Egypt and to challenge in dealing with Pharaoh. God wanted the Hebrew people to know that he was with them. His presence was among them when he, was, when he demonstrated himself in fire and cloud that led them. Once the people began their lives in Israel, the Lord's presence was manifested in the Ark of the Covenant as he led his people. When they relied on God's presence, it always went well. When they did not rely on God's presence, it never went well. God told Joshua, I will be with you. The Psalms are filled with David's desire for God's presence. And when he doesn't feel God's presence, David laments. He cries out and he says, God, I want to know that you are with me. And all of that led the people to the temple. And the temple was at that period in history the fulfillment of all of the promises that God would be present with his people. David prepared, Solomon built. The temple was the beautiful representation of God's manifested presence among his people. There were regulations and laws. There were standards surrounding the careful understanding of God's presence because he's holy. And if he wasn't holy, he wouldn't be God. I read a quote this week by a theologian named J. Ryan Lister who says this, there's a difference between saying God is everywhere and saying God is here. Most Christians believe in the first, but struggle with the second. It's easy to say God is everywhere, right? That technical term that we use sometimes, omnipresent, He is everywhere, kind of rolls off the tongue, right? particularly for a believer. But that is fundamentally different from saying God is here. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is here among us, with us, it's easy to believe that God is everywhere. Nothing escapes His eye. His power is there. Nothing is beyond His sight. But that's different from saying God is here in this place at this time in the midst of everything we see and struggle with and know and wish for. God is here. You can know the power of the ocean like intellectually but that's different than standing on the shore, isn't it? I can know God is out there somewhere. Maybe He sees me. Maybe He knows. He's out there. That's different from saying He's here. And the temple was the representation of the manifested presence of God's power and activity in the world. Israel was God's holy kingdom. Jerusalem was God's chosen holy city. The temple was God's holy footstool. And the holy of holies in the temple was the actual presence of God with His people. The presence of God was in the Holy of Holies and worked out across the whole world. What made it holy, what made it holy was God's presence. Peter knows that his audience knows all of that. They know it all. They know about God's presence or the promise of God's presence and they know what the temple represented, that God was present, that God was with them. Peter knows it and he knows that his audience knows it too. And he also is aware that they have been exiled 
from that perceived presence, from that holy city, from that holy footstool. They have been cut off from the chosen kingdom. And as we've talked about over the last seven or eight weeks, they have struggled on a level with what that looked like and what that meant for them and doubted, no doubt, doubted and felt off because they remember what it was. And what's the thing that Peter says, at least in our text today? Presence. Read along with me, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in the fourth verse. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to to do. Catch what Peter says. Peter says that you are a living stone. And though you have been rejected, though you have been beaten, though you have been punished, though you have been persecuted, God is with you. He said it all. What's God doing? He's taking you as you are and building you up into His own house, His own temple that is filled with His presence to the glory of His name. It's no small detail that Peter says believers are being built together into a house or temple. Now, here's here's the 30,000-foot view, and I want to drill down in a minute, but here's the 30,000-foot view that I want you to see about these couple of verses. God sees you right now with everything going on, as a stone that can be used to build the house of His presence. Everything in the Old Testament points us to the presence of God and Peter borrows that vocabulary, borrows that imagery and says, right where you are in Asia Minor, you're God's house. And not just you individually, but collectively, you are God's house. Filled with God's presence. It may not feel like it. The world may try to convince you of anything else but God's presence. God himself is with you. I think it's really important for people to see clearly particularly in times of exile and change and confusion and hardship. And I I can't promise a lot uh, from a worldly perspective because things obviously change so rapidly. But one thing I do know to be true, if you listen to any other voice in the world, you will be told everything else. But when you listen to the Lord when you root your life on the Word, one of the promises you bank on is that God is present. It's a promise. And it just is. And the world will do everything it can to convince you that it's not true. And Peter says, no, 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 no. don't listen to that. 
You are God's house. In Asia Minor? Yeah. Beaten and confused? Yes. You are God's house. Maybe you look at your circumstances, your feelings, and you just don't feel qualified to be God's house. Maybe you look at the mistakes of the past or the present, the unknown and the worry and the anxiety for the future, and you hear what I'm saying and you say, yeah, I believe all of that intellectually that I'm God's house, but I don't feel God's presence. And maybe you're thinking, if I don't feel God's presence, then I can't be used to build God's house. There's one little phrase that I really want you to laser focus on today. There's this little phrase that is easy to miss. It's found in verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. Being built. Being built. He didn't say you have been built. He didn't say you will be built. He said you are being built. This phrase means, just basically, <laughs> that the building has started. Can we agree about that? But the building is not done. Can we agree about that? You're being built. You're under construction. That's what Peter says. Do you struggle with patience? I, I don't know about you. I'll speak for myself. I, I think probably all of us on a certain level struggle with patience. I know I do, right? I want what I want, and I want it now. I mean, we're in the routine of like calling the internet provider regularly because the internet is not fast enough. We struggle with patience. We want what we want, and we want it now. It is bred into us, it seems, on a certain level. Patience is terribly difficult for the American audience. Peter says, you're being built. Not you have been. Not you will be. You are being built. God, listen, God does not see you as limited by the mistakes of the past, the concern of the present, or the fear for the future. He doesn't see you as limited, as having boundaries because you are being built. You're not done. You're not finished. He's not done. He's not finished. He doesn't see the current construction of your family the current construction of your spiritual health, the current construction of your relationships as the boundary for where you will be. You are being built. I want you to reflect for just a minute. Reflect right where you are for just a minute. Where are you at spiritually, relationally? Like how are things? Do a spiritual checkup. Where are things at? How are things? Now, let me ask you this question. Where do you wish you were? If you could visualize an image of where you wished you were spiritually, where do you wish you were? What would that look like? Where do you want to be? 
Can I ask you a question? Do you think you would be more patient with yourself? Maybe more patient with others? If you saw yourself as under construction? If you saw yourself as being built? As opposed to limited by the boundaries of our present. God doesn't see where you're at today or where you used to be in the past as a limitation for where He can take you in the future. It's not how God sees. The enemy wants you to believe, the evil one wants you to believe, that where you are at this moment is your boundary. That the mistakes you made 20 years ago are your boundaries. It's such great news that that's not true. Peter is writing to people. Check this. Peter is writing to people who are being built, which means they don't have it all together, which means they're not perfect, which means they have not figured everything out. But how does God see them? What does Peter say God says about them? You are chosen. You are precious. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built. They are under construction, but God still says they are chosen and they are precious. See yourself that way. Let me tell you what this does when you see yourself as being built. It will make you more patient with yourself and with other people. What would change if you saw yourself that way? Chosen and precious. What would change about the folks that sometimes you have conflict with if you saw them as chosen and precious? As being built rather than as complete. Remember, so much of what Peter says in this letter to the folks in exile, to the elect exiles, was not just written for an individual growth. It was written for a collective growth, putting off the perishable attributes and characteristics in the world and putting on the imperishable has individual um, positive gain, but it also affected all of the relationships that they had. Putting away the old life sees its fullest benefit in your relationships, maybe with the people you're with right now. Same is true for this. They are chosen and precious. And catch it, being built Let me give you a challenge. As you interact with people at work, at home, in church, as you interact with people, I think if we start to digest what Peter says for ourselves, but also for other people, do your best to see others the way God sees them, not limited by their present reality, not held in with boundaries by their past mistakes, but as chosen and precious and under construction and with the Lord, endless opportunity. People who are imperishable are people who see others and themselves the way God does. You think about robust relationships. When I see you as chosen and precious, when I see you filled with opportunity because God is doing something in your life, do you think that helps us push against conflict, jealousy, envy, and strife? There's a big point we need to make here as we close. Notice what all that's built on. 
Peter says you are being built, verse 4, as you come to Him. You can't miss it. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built. As you come to Him. Don't miss that statement tucked away in that fourth verse. If you need building, if you need further construction, and by the way, that's all of us, the only way that happens is by going to Him. Coming to Him. As you come to Him, the level that you come to the Lord directly relates to the level that you are being built. That's how it works. If you don't come, then building won't happen. If you want building to happen, and maybe not just for you individually, but relationally, you've got to go to Him. Go to Him. Tell Him. Seek Him. Pursue Him. Bless Him. You see how all this is built? on what Peter has said throughout it all. It is in God's presence that change happens. And it is only in the presence of Jesus Christ that eternal change happens. There's no other source, there's no other well, there's no other wisdom. The only wisdom is the wisdom of Jesus and it's in His presence, the presence that was demonstrated throughout the Old Testament that fills your life right now. Catch this. You are a house of God still under construction. God doesn't fill you with His presence once you are complete. God fills you with His presence as you are being built. Take a breath. Give yourself some grace. Be patient with others. You are being built. Now, what do we do with all of that? Once we know and trust that we are being built, we'll talk about that next week. We invite you to be back with us. Let's have a word of prayer together. God, I'm grateful for the time that we've been able to share. Father, it is so difficult at times for us to see ourselves and others the way you do. We pray for eyes to see. Father, I pray that we would be patient with ourselves, that we would be patient with others, that we would seek you above all things, that we would realize that we are being built. That we don't have to have it all together to feel your presence, that your presence changes us right where we are. I pray that we would invite that presence to change us however we need to be changed right now. In the name of Jesus and through His power, we pray. Amen. Be blessed this week.